Hi, everyone. Thanks so, so much for joining us this evening. My name is Elena. I'm with Napa Bookmine, and we are so excited to be welcoming the authors of We Are the Land, A History of Native California. William J. Bauer Jr. is an enrolled citizen of the Round Valley Indian Tribes and professor of history at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And Damon B. Akins is Associate Professor of History at Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina, and a former high school teacher in Los Angeles, and he grew up in Oklahoma. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and let them take it away. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming. We really, uh, Damon and I both really appreciate it. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm outside. I When I ever have meetings, I've been pushed to my outside backyard. So uh, Damon has a much better, like more kind of academic setup for these kind of events. I know like half my, you can't see half my face and, and but uh, at least you can see a little bit of the, the Las Vegas background here behind me. Uh, again, uh, my name is uh, William Bauer. Uh, I'm an enrolled citizen of the Round Valley Indian tribes of Northern California. Uh, I'm a professor of history at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and I'm speaking to you, to, uh, speaking to you today uh, from uh, Southern Paiute lands in Southern Nevada. Uh, and I am on the East Coast. I'm Damon Akins. I'm at uh, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, the land of the uh, Sara, the Saponi people, um, and happy to be here, although it's a bit later for me than it is for you, but given that I'm an East Coast historian working on California issues. This has sort of been a long, <laughs> I'm often uh, late to the game, it seems, at least a few hours behind. Yeah. Uh, but we're really happy to be there and, um, or be here, there, um, and thank you for coming. It, Damon, I, I felt really bad for you when I looked at the time today, it's like, since you're like three hours ahead of me, is like, it means like you're doing this at 10 o'clock at night? That's, <laughs> yeah. I, I apologize for that, right? Oh no, I'm, I think I'm doing all right. I think I'm okay, still good. quite, it's been a, been a, a long day, but I'm excited to talk about the book. Had some, uh, had some espresso and you're, and you're ready to go, right? Absolutely, yeah. I, so I think what Damon and I kind of th thought we would do tonight is just kind of talk a little bit about why we wrote the book. We might do a little bit of a, a reading from some of the text and then kind of hopefully kind of open it up for some question and answer. Because uh, I think that always generates kind of the best parts of, of kind of having people think about what they what they thought think about the book or what they want to know, uh, what they know uh, uh, about it. So, you know, I think what, when, we, when we first started to kind of do a book like this, um, or what, what the book is right now is it's a survey of California Indian history, um, literally from, as, as we kind of, as we were saying, is from creation to, to literally 2020. Um, Damon, I think, right, it's, it, it was about a year ago today almost. It, it's been a right yeah. about this time when we sent this book to the press uh, for, you know, to, to go through the kind of the production stage. And so it's been, it's been kind of interesting to kind of sit back and think a little bit about what it's been like in the last year as this book has kind of gone from, uh, you know what it looks like on Microsoft Word to to actually kind of the physical text that we see that 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 is in that is in our hands or hopefully is in in your hands as well. Um, and we, I mean we, we you know we we finished this book literally kind of a year ago, right? And so I think one of the kind of the great things about that is we were actually able to kind of include make it as timely as possible, meaning that we included some references to uh, the COVID 19, 19 pandemic in California and how it kind of um, and how kind of California Indian nations were able to kind of respond and shape kind of that, what, what we've been kind of going through uh, in the last year. Um, as, we wrote, as we wrote this book, I think one of the things that, that we went through is um, we wanted to refute the notion uh, that California Indians have disappeared from the state. Uh, I think a central kind of guiding argument that we have in the book is that um, indigenous peoples of California are actually cent central uh, to understanding the history of California in, in that you cannot understand the history of California without understanding the history of the indigenous peoples uh, in, in what we kind of understand the region. Um, and I think part of that is, it, I mean, Damon will have his kind of the reasons why he, he thinks that that's important. But I think one of the reasons why I thought, I thought that was important is about two years ago, I was having a conversation with a, um, with a, with a California Indian writer uh, and, and he was talking to me and he said, you know, he, and he was kind of talking about how there was still that kind of pervasive idea that California Indians had disappeared in the state, that he was still experiencing that even in like, you know, the late in the, in the early 2020 and or early 20 teens, excuse me. Uh, and so I think we wanted to kind of write a book that foregrounded kind of California Indians as being kind of central to the state, but also kind of 
kind of a vibrant aspect of, of California uh, now. And so kind of a central kind of argument that we make in the book is that California Indians are central to kind of California history. And they are so because uh, California Indian people have maintained a relationship with the land uh, at the same time as settler colonial policies uh, enacted by Spain, uh, Mexico, and then California and then the United States uh, have attempted to kind of divorce indigenous peoples uh, from the land. And I think that's kind of what we try to encapsulate in the, in the title of the book, right? Uh, we are the land. I think the idea that uh, we are the land kind of centers California Indians and the history of California uh, and making the argument that you cannot understand California history uh, without California Indian history. Yeah, I think the only uh, a couple of things I'd add there. One is uh, to, to go back to some of the things that we were saying. I really would encourage people to ask questions because you know this is a this is a size of an audience that we can really engage with and i'm looking forward to that so as you have questions you know feel free please just uh, put them in the chat or designate raise a hand or something i'd love to hear but then we will have some time at the end um you know i think willie was pointing out that the that we finished the book about a year ago and it's a weird time to think back to a year ago because a lot has happened in that last year and so even though we were so um intentional about really bringing it up to the present and making sure that we were making connections with things that were ongoing. I don't, I don't know that, that we could have predicted where we are now. And uh, so I'm not suggesting that I'm ready to write the next revised edition, but I, I will say that I do have a little scratch pad where I've started writing some things down about, you know, how it might be different going uh, the second next time around. And I think some of the, the really dramatic changes in, um, the public visibility of the land back movement and other things such as that. Obviously, a lot of this energy came out of the protests around George Floyd, um, and that ha hadn't started a year ago. So it really does seem like a um, a really rich moment. The other thing I was going to say is, um, you know, Willie is making the argument in, uh, in, that we make in the book that you can't understand California history without understanding uh, its indigenous history. You could make the same or a similar argument about almost any place that you can't understand the history of the place without understanding the indigenous history. But I do want to make a case for why California, that's particularly true. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, California has the largest number of federally recognized uh, tribal communities. That's rancherias, reservations. It has the county that has the largest population of native people. That's Los Angeles. It has the county that has the largest number of Indian reservations and rancherias, San Diego, and the list sort of goes on and on. I mean, it's, it, it is a place that um, remains very indigenous, but because, you know, I had a friend years and years and years ago, I, when I first moved to California, a good friend of mine, his dad was a fairly colorful character and we were packing the car up. He said, you know, Damon, I'm gonna give you some advice. There's two of every kind of person in the world and one of them lives in California. <laughs> being sort of struck by like what a weird thing that is to say, but my time in, in, in LA in particular showed me that there's just so much in California that it's easy for people to miss the incredibly dense and rich nature of its indigenous population today. And I think that makes it, if not unique, at least really critical that we, we pay attention to the indigenous history and its relationship to the state's history. And as I think both of us will, will attest to and discuss in, as we move through tonight, there, that's not a narrative that had been readily accessible to people uh, when we started writing the book. It was something that um, scholarly friends of mine, academics, really smart people would would admit, like, I don't, I don't know much about that. I don't, I don't even know where to look, you know, because there weren't really good accessible sources that would help people understand that history. Yeah, I, I think a, a great part of writing this book actually was that we were able to build on uh, the previous work of, of indigenous scholars, right? I mean, um, so there have been kind of surveys like this of California and in Indian history. Uh, the first was written by a Lenape scholar, Jack Forbes, who, who wrote Native Americans in California, Nevada in the 1960s. And then he re re revised this in, in the 1980s. Um, Forbes was a, a leading figure in the development of American Indian and, and Western history in the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, he wrote on, on Ketchum history. Um, and then he was kind of a political activist uh, and um, in the realm of education, he helped found kind of DQ University for indigenous peoples uh, and the Native American studies program at the University of, of California, Davis. Uh, and I think the other person that kind of inspired us to kind of do this project was um, Rupert uh, and, and Jeanette Costa 
who wrote uh, Natives of the Golden State, uh, kind of another kind of survey of, of, of California Indian history. Uh, Rupert was Kawia uh, from Southern California, also kind of a political activist in the realm of education in the 1960s, kind of writing about how uh, American Indians were depicted in textbooks and especially kind of uh, the, the treatment of, of indigenous peoples in California in the, in the state uh, curriculum. Um, but I think, but, you know, when, when Damon and I kind of hatched the idea for this book, and we don't want to tell you when we hatched the idea for this book, because it's been, a, <laughs> we both kind of joke, maybe it's been, it's been a, a few years now. Um, I, you know, the problem was, you know, both of those texts were a little bit dated by now. Um, you know, you know, we're talking about books that were written in the 1980s, and even in the 1990s. Um, they're hard, or they're uh, a little bit more kind of, it, it's difficult for people to get them. They're not mm -hmm. in print as readily a, a, um, anymore. Um, and I think that the big issue that I think both Damon and I recognize as we are kind of talking about how to kind of write this book is that they didn't often cover the 20th and the 21st century, obviously the 21st century, mm -hmm. uh, with as much depth as we needed to. I think that there's this idea that California Indian history gets kind of isolated in either the Spanish mission period uh, or even the California gold rush. And there isn't kind of something out, outside of that. So that California Indians kind of disappear at, uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. And so we wanted to kind of write a book that centered or kind of really kind of devoted a lot of time to and space to California Indian history in the 20th and try to get into the 21st century as, as possible. So it's kind of nice, I think, to see that at least, you know, three, three chapters of this book are, are firmly grounded in the 20th century whereas kind of previous texts uh, did not really kind of give as much time and space to the, to the 20th, uh, 20th century. Yeah, yeah. I also want to point out uh, uh, Dr. Rose Sosa War Soldiers uh, with us tonight and, and her dissertation on, on Rupert Costo is, uh, is like, you know, an amazing resource um, that we uh, were, were really happy to have at our disposal. <laughs> Somebody has done a tremendous amount of work on, on Rupert Costo um, and grateful for that. Um, you know, I, I wanted to maybe move into a reading that sort of highlights some of these issues. You know, as Willie's saying, we really wanted to focus on the 20th century, 21st century. And I, you'll probably get tired of us saying that over and over again. But I think if you aren't as familiar with this, the historiography of the writing about California Indian history, this, this is a fairly common pattern in what we might call recuperative narratives, narratives where um, major events um, come to dominate a history. So in this case, as Willie said, the missions and the gold rush come to dominate California history. And, and Indians are entirely left out of that. And so that first wave is really attempting to bring the, na the natives back into those those established narratives. And that's a necessary first step. Um, but but we were wanting to move beyond that because there's so much work that has done a really good job of, of, of plugging native histories back in. And we wanted to really not just you know, follow that, but, but try to think about this holistically. What does, what does a holistic approach mean? And a holistic approach has to spend a lot of time, preferably equal amount of time in the time frames and the moments when we traditionally don't think of native people, right? So instead of it being, uh, you know, 75% about the gold rush and 25% of everything else, we really wanted to evenly space it out. So I'm going to read a little bit. It's about two, two and a half minute excerpt, and it comes from chapter seven. Uh, and chapter seven uh, deals with the late 19th, early 20th century into the, the, the 20s. Um, and uh, it's called Friends and Enemies. And it's uh, the, the basic argument of the chapter is that the native Californians were able to leverage attention from folks who were billing themselves as friends, capital F friends, as in the Quakers. I teach at a Quaker institution, so... Uh, I, I'm, I am familiar with the Friends and um, familiar with the Friends' reputation with Native people. It's a, it's a very complex and problematic in some ways relationship, but also lowercase Friends, people who just came to California, activists, reformers, and others who wanted to help Indians. Uh, and often that help was heavy-handed and um, misguided. And, uh, but nonetheless, Natives were able to use that assistance, that energy, that attention to, to redirect it to their own, their own ends. And so the brief excerpt that I want to read involves... Um, questions about citizenship um, and also an organization called the Mission Indian Federation, which was founded in Riverside in 1920, uh, perhaps a couple years earlier, there's a few different origin stories, but certainly by 1920 it had a constitution and, and uh, widespread membership across Southern California and became um, at one point such a pest to the government that in the National Archives, there was a collection of documents about the Federation that were literally in pest control. That was in the folder 
for other forms of so like you know next to documents about like how to eradicate mice and how to uh, clamp down on the bug population so literally viewing them as a pest um, anyway this i think will give you a sense of some of that Indians acted on the promise of citizenship in other ways. In late 1925, Federation member Vidal Mojado and six representatives of, representatives of the La Jolla and Rincon reservations brought an equity suit against the Southern Sierra Powers Southern Sierra's power company. The suit alleged the company attempted to construct a telephone line across the reservations without their permission. Earlier that year, the Federal Power Commission granted the power company a license to construct and operate a power line across the reservation. In October, Indians ejected the power, line, the power company's employees from the reservation and removed the company's telephone poles, some of which they had contracted to install. The Indians brought a legal action to secure a court order to prohibit the company from returning to construct telephone lines and requiring that they pay damages for the completed construction. The nine Indians named in the suit argued that the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act invalidated previous laws which gave authority to approve infrastructure projects on reservations to the Secretary of the Interior. As citizens, the plaintiffs argued that, that, uh, as citizens, the plaintiffs argued that the power company's actions constituted trespass because it failed to, they had failed to secure approval from the Indians themselves. The power company claimed that it did not trespass because the Indians did not own the lands. Rather, the land was patented to the band and held in trust by the U.S. government from whom the power company had received permission. Furthermore, Southern Sierra's countersued on the grounds that Indian citizenship in no way affected previous legislation and Indians conspired to interfere with their rights. In February of 1926, the judge agreed with the power company and denied that the Indians owned the land. They therefore did not have the right to grant rights of way. The judge issued a permanent injunction against all members of the Rincon and La Jolla bands against any further acts disturbing the power company and its actions. Complications emerged. According to several participants, sometime in 1924, a meeting had taken place in a barn on the reservation. Indians, the federal, uh, uh, Indians, the federal aid, Indian agent and attorneys representing both the Indians and the power company had agreed that the company would pay the Indians $2,500 for the right of way across Indian land. The money went to the attorney who assisted the Federation in bringing the lawsuit. On the surface, this may appear as yet another in a series of legal actions benefiting the attorneys more than those who brought the charges. But the action demonstrated an opportunism and assertiveness that characterized a shift in Indian activism in the 20th century. Both Vicente Albanez and Bruno Sovinish worked for the power company, placing poles across the reservation. Both were also co-plaintiffs in the lawsuit filed by Vidal Mojado, Mojado against the power company. In using a settlement payment for rights of way to fund a subsequent lawsuit to deny those rights while working for the company that they sued for the work they themselves completed, the Indians of the region adeptly used the legal system to their advantage. Even if they did not win the court case, they leveraged settler interest in Indian land and resources and tacked against that pressure in ways that differed from ways available to Indians in the 19th century. I've always found that story fascinating. Um, not maybe fascinating is not quite the right word, just uh, uh, so in, in, illustrative. Um, that that we often need to remind, um, it feels like I need to remind my students and I, I think I need to sometimes remind myself that, um, that that it's never cut and dry, it's never one side or the other, it's often very, very complicated and um, in this case it was very complicated in a way that was uh, surprisingly simple. The, uh, the Indians that worked for the power company had inside no inside knowledge into what was going on and they therefore could more easily sue the company for the work they had done. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that was one of the things that we both wrestled with, wrestled with as, as we wrote this book is the kind of the complicated nature of, of California, right? And, and indigenous history in, in California. Uh, if you kind of look on any kind of map, like California is one of the most diverse places for in, indigenous peoples. There's more than, you know, 100 languages spoken by uh, by indigenous peoples in the uh, w w within the boundaries of the current of, of the current state. Uh, but even if you kind of get into the the history of the state, uh, California is extremely diff diff uh, diff different than right. So that Northern California has a kind of a, a very kind of different history than than Southern California. Um, we have kind of different kind of developments in both regions. So you know, it, you know, in sometimes even to kind of simplify what we're talking about. 
Um, in the in the 1930s, the United States passed something called the Indian Reorganization Act that called for kind of political development, more kind of political reorganization and economic development uh, in in Indian country across the United States. And on one hand, right. Um, Tribes in Northern California tended to kind of favor kind of the Indian Reorganization Act, and tribes in Southern California did not want, uh, and then kind of kind of rejected or kind of were opposed to Indian the Indian Reorganization Act. And then you see a kind of a very similar history or a very similar story going on in the 1950s, right? So there was the United States passed a policy or kind of enacted a policy called termination that wanted to kind of end the trust relationship between tribes and the United States, and and for very kind of extremely valid reasons, kind of. Tribes in Southern California tended to kind of oppose uh, termination policy, but then tribes in Northern California were supportive of it, uh, or, or, um, or no, tribes in Southern California kind of supported termination, and then tribes in Northern California opposed uh, termination. And so it was kind of difficult, I think, sometimes to kind of get at the kind of the, the difficult and the diverse histories that we get that we see uh, that we see in the state. But I think one thing that I think we are we're both kind of happy with is being able to tell kind of the rich and, and deep history of, of, of indigenous peoples in, in within the boundaries of, of the state. Um, right, so not only that are California Indians kind of shaping kind of California history, but California Indians are shaping United States history. I, I, you know, for instance, I don't think that you could tell uh, the history of Indian gaming in the United States, for instance, without kind of centering that story in, in, in California and looking at the ways in which kind of California Indian actions kind of reverberate uh, across the, uh, the, the, the rest of the United States. And so I think it's kind of, um, so I, I think that the book kind of also will hopefully kind of center, uh, not only kind of center kind of California Indian histories in, in the state, but also be, have people kind of begin to think about the, the influence of California Indian people throughout the rest of the United States. Yeah, I, one thing I, I was thinking, so I, I used to teach high school in Los Angeles, and I've given a lot of thought to that recently because um, that was uh, some time ago, longer than I'd like to admit, and sometimes longer than it seems possible when I uh, think back on it. Uh, but in thinking about it, I remember how um, invisible uh, California natives were in the high school that I taught at in, in San Fernando Valley. I don't mean in the student population, I just mean in the, in the curriculum and the the you know, the iconography, all of this. So I'm always really curious to learn how people in California, especially over the years, have what they hear, what they know, what they learn, and, and equally as much like where they get this information from. Um, because uh, it is it is frustrating sometimes the way that the narratives that are really hidebound and tired and and yet still very powerful how they cling and they stay on and how there's such great scholarship and such great activism that is pointed out for example you know the first wave of this was just really trying to reestablish the fact that that native people are still here you know and it, and it was a it was a very clear first step that the native people have not disappeared and as willie pointed out after 50 years of activists making that claim people still think california indians have disappeared so it's it's a frustrating task when you realize how uh, powerful the wave of common knowledge is and how easy it is to get sort of swept aside. But it also is it's a fight that's worth fighting. And I think it's something that's you know, cer certainly going to provide lots of people with lots of in opportunities to do lots of work because it's going to require that to really slowly begin to shift this narrative. So one thing I'd love to hear from people in terms of the questions they have you know, or comments, I'd love to learn more about, you know, how you came to know what you know about California native people, whether it was from your own experiences or from, you know, uh, educational environment or newspapers or other things. Yeah, I, know, I think really. Damon, right, I think maybe one way that we try to address that in the book is, is um, we have a series of where native vignettes, mm -hmm. right, where we kind of focus in on one place in California, sometimes kind of well-known places like the East Bay or Los Angeles, um, other times uh, maybe less well-known places like uh, Ukiah, California, which is kind of near where, near, uh, near Napa and near, near where I grew up. Um, but, I, but I think that these short vignettes, what they do is they kind of reveal kind of the long-standing kind of indigenous presence in, in certain places that are uh, kind of important to people in California 
but also kind of indigenous peoples in 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 California. And so um, we kind of hope that kind of like by going through some of these vignettes, um, I think that they that you kind of begin to kind of reframe or rethink what you know uh, about California history. And so, Damon, like what what were you kind of hoping, Damon? Um, when when we kind of wrote those vignettes and what we'd hope our readership would take from it. Yeah, I mean, the, I think the vignettes came out of a couple different impulses. One was uh, an impulse that anybody who's ever tried to write chronologically based or, or you know, work that is, is time bound content wise. As historians, we're always trying to determine, like, do I, do I tell this story chronologically? Like, here's the beginning and here's the end. And I work with this with my students all the time, trying to get them to think about other ways to tell the story. Do we start at the end and go back? And and I think we were we we knew we wanted the basic structure of the book to be chronological because that was an important part um, of making this kind of argument about persistence and survivance. That we wanted people to understand that as they work through the book, they're working through time and and throughout all that time, Native people are surviving and thriving and and persevering. So the chronological organization was really important. Um, but the two other ways to organize things, at least the two other ways that I often give my students spatially or thematically, um, were also really valuable options. And so the vignettes were a way to sort of pause the chronological organization for a bit and spend some time thinking about places. And uh, there are there are nine of them. And as Willie said, they were um, they're short. They're you know five, six, seven, eight pages. I also really thought about those as a as a teaching tool something that's reproducible um i think this will surprise no one who's spent time in the classroom that occasionally students don't read the assigned reading and you come to class to have a discussion and they're not as well prepared as you might hope and i i, I had this idea that you know the, the, this is the type of reading that i would love to have in my back pocket as a Okay, take take a couple minutes and just read it right here in class because it sparks conversations. It's by no means definitive. They're just really suggestive of trends. And I think there's a lot of things people could do with those sections, whether it's using them in that context or using them as launching pads for um, you know, mapping exercises, experiential learning things. So that, that was where I was really interested in seeing how do we stop the chronological narrative and just spend some time and hoping that the readers could look out the window where they're reading the book and see something that they're reading about and and feel you know compelled to get out and go look around i you know, napa was not one of the of the locations um but uh wow it could be a really useful one um you know the issues that it really has raised already the uh, Indian Reorganization Act of 19, 1934, 33, 34, and then the termination legislation beginning in the late 1950s, both of those are still exercising a powerful influence on Napa, as I'm sure residents of the city are well aware. Um, that's a, the, the nature of the, of the ongoing lawsuit that uh, with the Mishiwa Wapo, who um, appears to have ended, and I don't know that there's much more that the tribe can do, but that showed a really good point of showing how some place as iconic as Napa is, you know, literally wound up in um, these issues of native dispossession and, and, and indigenous history that, that are often seen as either something that's entirely unrelated or in some cases unrelated and not even really discussed. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm, thanks for sharing that, Damon, because I think one of the things that we, we consistently talked about, I mean, we had many, many conversations, you know, on, on the phone as we were kind of writing and crafting this book, is something about kind of audience or the people that we wanted to kind of read read this book. Um, I mean, so audience was kind of very important to the to the text uh, that we wanted to do. We wanted to write a book that was that could be useful for for California Indian people. And I think in part, I think one of the reasons or one of the ways in which we tried to get this was kind of inspired by both of our advisors. Um, both of us, both Damon and I, uh, got our PhDs at the University of Oklahoma. We both worked under um, Albert Hurtado, who wrote. Um, um, Indian survival on the California frontier. Um, but I think one of the things that Al always told me when when writing, like revising a dissertation for a book and thinking through books and, and, and that sort of thing, um, is, to, is to make sure to put forward people and their stories, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, I sometimes I hope, I, I mean, I do hope that as, as California Indian people read the book, they might see like a story about their aunt or their uncle or their grandparents. They might see a picture of their aunt, uncle, or grandparents in, in the book. I mean, so I think that kind of so having kind of being having uh, California and people kind of see their histories 
uh, in in California history, I think was vital was was important to how we were gonna we were writing this book. Um, but we also kind of wanted to kind of speak to to, to K through twelve teachers too. Um, I, yeah, as we've been kind of talking about, and Rose, who's on the on the call here tonight, uh, kind of knows right. There, there's there's kind of a there's been a kind of a long history of, of California Indian people critiquing. Uh, the K through 12, 12 curriculum, right? The uh, if, if you've been in California, you you may have done like the sugar cube mission kind of assignment, fourth grade, and that sort of thing. Um, but we want to have something maybe hopefully useful for K through 12 instructors so, so that they can pull off the shelf uh, and then maybe be able to kind of incorporate something that uh, something like from the book into their own teaching and into their own classroom. Um, and then hopefully, you know, people who are teaching California and California Indian history at the CSUs. Uh, the California State Universities, or even the University of California system, of, of giving something that kind of kind of privileges and centers kind of California Indian stories and California Indian people in the history of the state. Yeah, you know, Willie gave an interview the other day with I can't remember the radio station it was KWAL in San Francisco, and the interviewer whose name escapes me right now uh, said she opened the book and saw a picture of her grandmother, and it was just a really lovely thing to to hear um, because it's exactly you know I mean not. Not we're just we didn't write the book so that people would see their grandmother, but we we wrote the book so that people would see family, see stories, see things that were familiar to them, uh, and in some cases very familiar. So I loved hearing that that was the case. I'd also love to know if, did anybody in the audience uh, actually do the fourth grade mission project? I mean I don't know if you want to put it in the chat or uh, share what the uh, uh, project was, but. Um, but I'm I'm guessing we've got a few. It looks like I see a couple. I see Marilyn's head nodding, and <laughs> and uh, Elena says she did as well. We we had a really interesting conversation about this because at that stage we were working on the book, um, and we're trying to figure out what to do with that because it's been for so long such a you know a, a central part of California's education elementary school curriculum, and. Um, we tried a number of different ways to deal with it and uh, had this whole different kind of series of vignettes. Um, and we were, we were imagining what it would be like at different times in history for people to be doing that project. And um, I'll spare you all the details, but essentially what we were trying to do is, is go through and imagine what would it be like in 1950 for a kid to be doing that? I mean, what kinds of kids would be doing that? What kinds of things would they be privileging? What would be, you know, a Chicano kid in Los Angeles in 1970 will have a different viewpoint. African American kid in the 1990s would probably be looking at this very differently as well. But Willie um, had suggested that for the last one, uh, that the, the the last of these vignettes would be a Native student working in the present day and just coming to their uh, fourth grade classroom with a piece of MDF and some, you know, some grass like the the, the model train landscaping, and no mission at all, and I remember thinking at the time we were like, oh yeah, that's good. Oh, that's good. That's going to really, and what it, to go back to some of the things that we've talked about, so much has changed so fast that, um, that project is, is, is on its way out in many instant, in many, uh, school districts. Um, and you know, I mean, like it, it's just simply not, it's not the world it was five years ago. And, um, and so it's, it's been very interesting to uh, watch our work on the book sort of flow alongside these pretty dramatic changes in, in society and, and the way things are talked about or thought about. Yeah, so I think we're kind of getting close to our hour. So I, th I thought I would kind of do a reading a little bit about kind of an event that is kind of, I think important to um, kind of my family history and, and I think again, kind of centering kind of uh, California Indian history in the 20th and and also in, into the 21st uh, 21st century that I think I think speaks to some of the things that we've been talking about. So uh, this comes from the last chapter, which is entitled "Returning uh, Returning to the Land." Um, uh, Native people commemorated the traumatic events uh, in their past. Uh, in 1863, the United States forcibly removed 460 Concows and Maidus from their homeland near Oroville in Chico, California. Uh, the army imprisoned the Concows and Maidus in a corral outside of Camp Bidwell. Subsequently, mar malaria swept through the people uh, waiting for their forced march. Uh, on September 4th, 1863, the army began to march the Concows and Maidus the 100 miles from Camp Bidwell to the Round Valley Reservation. Only 277 Concows and Maidus arrived at Round Valley two weeks later. 
the rest remain behind on the trip uh, on the trail too sick to continue. Oral histories of the ethnic cleansing recalled soldiers killing, killing the elderly women and children. But native people at Round Valley and in Chico held this memory. In 1968 and in 1969, Round Valley tribal members reminded the state of California of this ethnic cleansing when the state and the Army Corps of Engineers proposed building a dam on the Eel River, which would have flooded the reservation and relocated the Round Valley people. And in 1993, Round Valley tribal member Galen Asville uh, worked with the National Forest Service to mark the trail with interpretive signs. Three years later, at the conclusion of that effort, the descendants of the survivors of the ethnic cleansing began an annual walk along the route. In 1996, people gathered at California State University Chico to hold the first walk. The Nome Cult Walk has been instrumental in the process by which Round Valley Indians heal historical trauma. Galen Asbill said, quote, there's a lot of hurt, a lot of pain in Round Valley. We can't change what happened, but we've got to heal sometime. I think the dedication will have some closure for us, end quote. Arlene Ward, then chair of the Machupta Band of, of the Chico Rancheria, said that her grandfather would not attend the first known cult walk. Quote, he would not come. He said it would, would be like going to a funeral. For others, though, the walk has been a way to unite the Round Valley community, much like uh, the flower dance at the Hoopa Valley Reservation. Fred Downey, a Round Valley tribal member, uh, added, quote, we're, we're able to do the walk together uh, and be a loose knit family again. The positive thing from this walk is the healing. We can learn a great deal and our kids can learn a great deal, end quote. Uh, additionally, Round Valley Indians established an inter intergenerational connections on the walk. Kenneth Wright, a uh, former chairperson of the Round Valley Reservation said, quote, it is important that our youngest members take part in this annual event, end quote. Uh, shortly after, uh, shortly before her death in 2001, uh, 2011, uh, my grandmother, uh, Anita Rome, the last living descendant of someone who was forcibly removed by the United States in 1863, greeted her children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren who participated in that year's walk. Yeah, that's, um, just wanted to let that sit there for a second. Um, what questions do, do, does the audience have? I'd love to hear some, some questions um, about your reactions or interests or thoughts about the book. Uh, so not much, many questions here in the chat box. So feel free if you want to unmute yourself and start your video and just ask or comment, uh, have a conversation. We are ready to do that. Or if you feel more comfortable putting your uh, question in the chat box, you can totally still do that. I'll make sure to ask it for you um, when we have a moment. So feel free, somebody start us out. Or if you wanna write it out and send it through Messenger Pigeon, uh, it, we'll get there at some point and we'll be happy to answer it. But. Hi, can I start with a question? Yes, please. Okay. Um, we're not getting great sound. Is anybody else having trouble hearing? It was it was going in and out. Maybe try again. You guys want to try that again? Uh, sure. Is this better? That's good. Yeah. That's okay. Much better. I I just moved closer. All technique. Um. So thank you so much for your for this presentation of this book. Sounds like a tremendous book, and I definitely look forward to reading it. Specifically, the the vignettes organization of the book sounded very appealing to me. Um, as a historian myself, I I cannot stop myself from asking about the sources and the research that you did. This sounds like an incredible project and a very, um, I guess, a very uh, extensive one to cover like a very extent period of time and also to make it accessible in small vignettes and to produce that kind of to yeah. to to convert that for a broad audience so if you can tell us more about your sources and like i don't know if this is an oral history project on the most recent aspect of the book 
or more like archival, archival uh, heavy on the beginning, I will be happy to hear more about that. Yeah, it's 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 all of those. Um, I can say a few things, and I'm sure Willie will have a lot to to add. You know, when we started the project, we knew it would be impossible for us to do something like provide coverage for this subject because of its breadth and its depth. So we knew, as Willie had said already, that we we wanted to focus on stories. We wanted to focus on stories that that center Native people and use those to carry larger narratives and weave them in and out. And so we paid really close attention to regional coverage as well as you know uh, other kind of ways to make sure that we're, the stories were as broadly representative as we w could make them. What that meant is that we were able, I mean, I think it has to be said, we couldn't have written this book if there hadn't already been a tremendous amount of scholarship that was on its, uh, that's been coming out recently, quite recently, but also that's been there for a while and just not getting the traction that it deserved. Um, so we were able to use a lot of, of great research, great writing, and uh, viewed this as a very synthetic project. My research focuses on late 19th, early 20th century Southern California. Willie's research focuses on Northern California, and he's done a lot with oral histories. He can explain that. I don't need to explain that for him. But so we, we used a variety of sources, everything from ethnographies to quantitative data, um, you know, uh, a variety of, of the kind of documents that are associated with the mission period, the, the, the census materials, so a real wide, wide range of, of resources, court cases. Um, but then also just a lot of, of secondary literature and stories that sort of showed up in different places. Um, and I think one other thing I would add is that we we were we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to deal with the sources in terms of the citations because it's not just the um, the sources that we use. But you know, on the one hand, we want to demonstrate that we've done the research and that there's plenty of of, of of guideposts that we can point people back into is that when I teach this, I always tell my students start with the footnotes. And um, but at the same time, we 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 knew it would be overwhelming for a lot of folks. So what we ended up doing instead is at the end of each chapter is about a you know one two three page. It's not even really an essay. It's it's a stretch to call it an essay because it's really more of a gesture. We're just saying here's where we got this information. If you're interested in these things, you can look at these sources. This quote came from this really phenomenal, uh, et cetera, et cetera, those sort of things. Um, and and we were hoping that at least that directs students and readers and people who are interested in in the direction of it, directs them toward uh, some rich places to start. Yeah, I, I think the only thing that I would add is, I think, uh, you know, a lot of this, so, you know, sometimes when you write a book, you're you're really kind of diving deep into kind of archival materials and it's very kind of heavily kind of primary source. And I think on one hand, uh, so on this, I think we didn't tend to kind of rely a little bit on secondary sources. Um, but I think that that was actually kind of a, a benefit for the, for the project. I think one of the things that I realized um, or kind of recognized as I kind of conclu we concluded re reading this book is that we are really standing on the shoulders of a lot of kind of great work produced by indigenous California scholars. Um, some of them are on the call tonight, which is Greg, Greg Rose's work is great. Um, Desiree, who kind of left a little earlier, I think, um, is, is kind of completing a dissertation at, at UC Davis. Um, and that's just kind of a, that's just kind of scratching the surface of kind of, uh, you know, co hopefully kind of, you know, kind of building on kind of this kind of great work that has long been produced by indigenous California scholars. Thank you. So we have a bunch of questions now in the chat box. So I'll go ahead and answer those. Um, if you do have one that you prefer to ask uh, in person, if you could use the raise hand feature or just Unmute yourself when a question after a question's been answered and jump right in front of me. That's fine. Uh, first one is: Do you see this book being used as a resource for those participating in the state's Truth and Healing Commission? You know that was that was that, that I I saw the, the the question come up in the chat and it reminded me of of something that happened or uh, an issue that came up when we uh, sent out the book for first reviews. Is I didn't think that we were initially kind of thinking that the book would hit kind of a kind of a political audience. Uh, but then someone who reviewed the book said, you know, hey, you know, actually the like, California state politicians should read this book. People at the state government need to, to read this book. And, and it, was, it was really kind of a it was kind of an eye opening um, kind of observation that the, the reviewer shared. And, and um, I, mean, I think we would hope that it would it would find an audience there and kind of reach kind of even kind of bigger audiences or not bigger, but kind of just more diverse or broader audiences than I think that we initially kind of envisioned that we wanted to hit. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's that's right. The only thing I'd add there is that you know I think the book serves a really useful function alongside other works. Uh, I'm thinking here about some of the scholarship that's really focused on genocide, the questions of genocide, the mid 19th century. You know, those books by nature are dense and rich and thick and just full of a lot of of documentation and they they do something really important, but what we hope our book does is contextualize that, bring it into a larger story so that people who, you know, let's be honest, aren't going to, I mean, like in some instances, uh, the they're not going to go that deep because they're not driven by the same kind of curiosity that drives a lot of academic uh, research. I'm thinking here of a lot of people in, you know, in, in um, yeah, the, the politicians, legislators, others who are busy and are trying to find how do I move through all this information and get it into a manageable chunk that I can do something with. And what I would hope is that the, the, our book would kind of work as an intermediary, a, a way to introduce people, point people toward work that's, that goes much, much deeper, but also give them a narrative that, that makes sense and is accurate and honest. It's a great question, though. Great, thank you. Next question is from David. Can you talk more about what makes California Native history distinct from other states or regions? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. It's a great question. I think there's a few things. One is, um, and these are not in order of like priority or, or uh, anything. I think just the question of genocide is one. Um, in no other place in the United States has the treatment of indigenous people been as explicitly and clearly a genocide as it was in California from 1848, 1875, 76. And that's just indisputable. And, and that it's not to dismiss the you know, violence that's been enacted against indigenous people in other places, but in no other place except maybe Texas and except a few other locations for a couple of years do you see the kind of sustained campaign against indigenous people brought about by settler colonialism. So that's not distinct on its own. But when you layer on top of that the state's Mexican and Spanish history, um, and the place that indigenous people played within Spanish and Mexican history, as in the case of Mexico, with full citizens with theoretically at least citizen, rights of citizens, um, you have uh, you know uh, this kind of layering effect where um, there aren't a lot of other places like that. Obviously, New Mexico, Arizona, some other locations, um, and so I think when you add some of those kinds of elements up, it's this sort of Venn diagram, and there's only California in the center. Uh, the density of the indigenous population and the diversity of the indigenous population is is pretty common all along the Pacific coast. Um, but but you don't see that kind of density and and close cropped intense diversity in certainly in the plains or back east. So I think you know if each of those California in each of those instances, California is like other places, but in when you take them all together, it, it is distinct in that particular way. Yeah, I think maybe just the only thing to kind of build on it is I, th I think one is, is as Damon kind of mentioned, right, it's, it's the diversity of, of California Indian people and, and California Indian communities. Uh, right? It, if you kind of look on a, even kind of a map of kind of like language groups, for instance, I mean, it, it is the most it, it is a it is the most kind of diverse region in in um, in North America, right? and I, and I think, and and then, and and the way in which that kind of that that diversity kind of carries on into the twenty in, into the present day, I think, is is another uh, a kind of another kind of significant kind of way in which kind of indigenous peoples of California are are kind of unique and and, and different. So, one thing to add there, when we did the when we did the maps, the the, the mm -hmm. cartographer that we commissioned is really great cartographer. And he came back and he essentially said, like, it is too much to put on the map. And we were like, well, we just got to make it small, the, the, the font smaller. And he's like, I can't go small. The press won't let me go smaller. And we had to have a series of emails with the press saying we, we need the font to be smaller on the maps because it is really important that the things that we are, are saying on the map are there. I mean, the fact that it's crowded is what makes the map so important. Um, and uh, we can't leave things out just because it doesn't fit. And so the press worked with us and we have, I, I think the maps turned out really beautifully. We have two, one that really shows kind of the, the as Willie was saying, the, the language and culture groups and then one that, that layers on top of that, um, you know, roughly the kind of present day, so to speak, with um, some of the issues at Strange. But it, it, it is a very dense map. Thank, thank you. Uh, next question is from Jana. Are there ways you'd like to see the book be used among ally organizations not associated with formal learning environments? 
I think I think in one end it goes back to something we were talking about, kind of even kind of governmental or political entities perhaps using the book. Um, I, I think that that's one way we, we we think about we kind of think about kind of allied organizations um, um, using it. Um, but I think just to kind of just general, I mean, hopefully kind of it, it will hit kind of a, just a general kind of a, kind of a general readership in 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 the state. I mean, I, I think. I think something like this has been kind of needed, like we've been saying kind of earlier in, in the talk. Um, is something like that, this is, I think, been needed in California, especially kind of to center kind of 20th and 21st century stories. And so hopefully it, it'll kind of hit that kind of broader, kind of more general audience that, that I think needs to be kind of made aware of these kind of histories and these stories. Yeah. I would say one thing that is, um... It, for me, I hope the book engages in conversations about social justice, but I hope it does so in a way that positions itself in a kind of tension with those conversations, because so often questions of social justice um, essentially reify or they, 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 are, they are centered around the idea of everybody needs to be included in this thing called the United States. In other words, the settler state needs to be centered and everybody should you know, be given an equal chance to be a participant in this settler state. And I really would hope that the book could you know, enter into those conversations but still offer this uh, kind of a glancing perspective that says, that that's not that the settler state shouldn't be the end all. Uh, sovereignty cuts in a different direction, and 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 it, it's a different thing, even though it might share some of the same impulses and instincts. Okay, next question from Rose. Uh, looking forward to the use of it in classrooms. Are you planning to design a discussion guide? Uh, that has been discussed. <laughs> Um, and I think our, you know, I, I am very excited to learn that you might be using it in the classroom and, um, would, would be very pleased for there to be a, uh, a study guide or discussion guide that could be, um, used. There's a lot of information that, that we, you know, a lot of the, the current events kind of stuff that, that we, I mean, again, the, the Mishiwa Wapo case doesn't really show up in the book, even though it was in the book throughout the whole draft. It just eventually we took it out because it became too complicated as a story to tell um, while it's happening. And I think those are the sorts of things that would be better served by a discussion guide. So I, you know, I, I think it would be a great thing. Perhaps we will. Yeah, I think we both kind of talked about this a little bit ago, and then when we when we got to the conclusion of the book, we were happy to, to like send it off. It's like sending it, it's like when kids go to college, right? You're you're sad that they're gone, but you know, on one hand, they 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 got to go, they got to get out of the house, right? Right, Damon. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, but I think too. I mean, I think that's a good point. I mean, I think one of the great things that I've kind of recognized even after since the you know since we we concluded the book is is and, and David Damon kind of alluded to this earlier in the discussion is I mean shoot we're, we're you know we're we're a, we're a year away and and there's also kind of we, we recognize the need for maybe even a second edition right is that there's some things that we just didn't cover for a variety of reasons either it, it didn't conclude or it didn't kind of we didn't kind of quite see it fitting into the narrative uh, immediately. Um, and, and so I think that that would be kind of a great way of kind of, of having some kind of uh, discussion guide of, of thinking about things that we didn't discuss. Uh, I'm thinking of um, kind of taking down the dams on the Klamath River, for instance, yeah. um, would be a kind of a great way to kind of connect what is going on in contemporary California with this kind of longer history of, of settler colonialism and indigenous survivance within yeah. the boundaries of the state. And in the same, by the same token, the uh, destruction of statues of Junipero Serra yeah. um, as part of the the protests after George, George Floyd's death, that's a, a you know a really really great thing to gesture at as part of a discussion uh, with the book. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so we've got just a few more minutes and a bunch of questions left. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that if you have your question in already, we'll get to it and probably leave it there. Uh, the next one is from Melinda. What has the reaction of the community of the book? What has the reaction to the book from some of the community members whose family stories are in the book been? 
So I, I think one thing we haven't heard anything yet, uh, but I think the book is is pretty new. I mean, I, I think it's only been out for for about a month now. Um, yeah, so a month I don't tomorrow. think that we've been able to kind of hear hear uh, her voice. I haven't been able to go home actually because of the pandemic for about a year and a half. So I mean, we're, for about yeah, for about a year, uh, and so. Um, I haven't been able to kind of get in touch with with people that I, that from from where I'm from to, to to hear about the book yet. But I I think it's I think it's just a little early in the kind of the publication game. But I think you know what Damon was saying earlier with the the radio interview that we did earlier in the in uh, earlier in the month is I think people like, when they do see that they're kind of the family histories and the family stories or even pictures. I think it uh, I think there is a, kind of a positive take from it. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Mark is curious, what was the most surprising thing you learned while researching the book? It's it's strangely difficult to go back and be surprised by it in retrospect. I'm not sure if I can make that that thought clear. It's it's um, it's been such a, a big project um, that it that I'm having to kind of like go back into the closet, so to speak, and like look for something that surprised me. Um, I don't know, Willie. You have something that jumps out at you? No, no, nothing's kind of coming. Actually, you know, one of, one of the things that I think not not surprising to me, but I think something that you all would always keep telling me, which I always appreciated as I read the book, was that as we were writing the book and kind of doing kind of different chapters is, is like I would come across some like anecdote and, and you would say, no, 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 that they were doing that like in the previous chapter, right? Yeah. But so like, the, like when we think about things like activism, like you're saying, like Damon mentioned earlier, like the land back movement, uh, land back movement that is going on kind of right now. Well, California Indian people have been talking about land back since, you know, since like 1769, right? I mean, yeah, there's just, yeah. this is, so the, the things that we kind of think are unique and new now actually kind of have a, a longstanding kind of historical resonance and indigenous peoples have been fighting for these things within the boundaries of the state for hundreds of years. Um, and and I, I think that was one thing that I, I really kind of appreciated and took, uh, and I, I you know, one thing I appreciated after kind of concluding the writing the book. Yeah, and that's a good point. Um, okay, so this last one was actually a comment, uh, so hopefully I will read it properly. Uh, so this is from Frank. I assisted with a project aimed at high schoolers and we found that a way to make the map of federally recognized tribes more digestible was to turn it into a coloring activity where we identify groups of tribes by the method of federal recognition, i.e. military reservations, executive acts, CE Kelsey investigation related rancherias, church gifts, Etc. Any thoughts on the, that comment? Sounds like a wonderful activity. Um, I, you know, I, I'd imagine you'd need like big sheets of paper because it just it strikes me as I, like here's an example. At one point, we were we often produced our own maps just to kind of help us spatially organize things that we thought might eventually end up, but realized real quickly there wasn't enough space to to do. It. One of the ones that I put together was a map on um, the Tilly Hardwick case and how when tribes were terminated and how their termination was overturned and and it was color coded so you know <laughs> the same sort of ways like this was done prior to that after this one this was done through the co congress this was done through the courts and and you know it got really complicated and uh, this is for somebody you know I'd been working on the project for a decade and um so as a former high school teacher I think it sounds like a wonderful exercise because I would imagine it'd be very challenging but in that challenge is the, the the depth of the work that you'd want students to see. Yeah, I think one thing that would do too is, is, is especially if you did them kind of as you kind of noted in the, in the comment, right, is change over time, right? So if you have kind of like this linguistic map and then how does that map change to, as you were noting, right, the, the rancherias and, and res, contemporary reservations and, and that sort of thing. I think that would be kind of like, as Dan was saying, kind of a cool kind of assignment to kind of see uh, see how that progresses. Awesome, thank you. Uh, anything you want to end with, Willie and or Damon? Um, just thanks again for coming out, and I, I, you know, I look forward to hearing more reactions to the book once people have had a chance to read it. And really appreciate you taking the time to come out and and share your yeah, thoughts. Thank with you, us. everyone, for coming and spending in the the evening with us. Oh, that it could be in person. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much, Damon and Willie. We so appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you everyone who joined us this evening. We do have copies uh, with signed uh, book plates as well. Ha ha. I, I heard store. coffee. I heard coffee. We have coffee. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, we also, and we do ship domestically in case you're not here in Napa. So uh, if you're interested in that, you can find it on our website or pop into the store. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us this evening. We so appreciate your time. Wish you thank all you, a everyone. wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.